Hello, students. Uh, in the interest of time, we skipped over a presentation that was uh, planned for last night's meeting, and it has to do with the uh, questions about vacuums. And so uh, at the end of the session, uh, Dr. Jacobs said that her, uh, she was thinking that when Aristotle says nature abhors a vacuum, uh, he was talking about it uh, on sort of a material level. Uh, but it turns out uh, those people, uh, there are people who objected to it even on an epistemological level, that it was something that was impossible uh, to occur. So I've got a few slides here talking about uh, this debate about vacuums uh, as it occurred in the uh, mid-17th century, and particularly between two people, Thomas Hobbes and Robert Boyle. All right, so uh, the first slide says, horror vacui, nature abhors a vacuum. That was a an idea that was common among uh, scientists and uh, sort of uh, people. Again, we they weren't they didn't call themselves scientists. They were natural philosophers. So so we have the question: Can vacuums exist in nature? Plato says no. The void is nothing, and nothing cannot rightly be said to exist because existence refers to things, not to nothings. Aristotle also says no. If there were a vacuum in nature, matter would simply rush. To fit in to fill it. So Aristotle's objection is more of a physical objection. Plato's is a sort of uh, existential objection. Lucretius says yes. Following the philosophy of Epicurus, he writes that there are only atoms and vacuity, nothing else. Hero of Alexander says yes, but his attempt to create a physical vacuum failed. Rene Descartes says no. His cosmology included a plenum that filled all the space between perceived objects. So one of his explanations of how the planets travel around uh, the sun is that uh, there's this stuff between the planets. It's not empty space. And that stuff then sort of could be working almost like, like gears to move things around. Robert Boyle says yes. He creates an air pump that produces a vacuum within which he performed experiments. And Thomas Hobbes says yes then no. Hobbes was initially a vacuist, but later became a planist, at least according to Shapin and Schaefer. So the first is a picture that was actually in Dr. Jacobs' presentation. It's an experiment on a bird in an air pump by Joseph Wright of Derby, 1768. So that's the painter who created it in the 1700s. And he's pointing to an event that would have occurred 100 years earlier in the mid-1600s, and it would have been Robert Boyle. And there are two things to note in this. First off, you've got a group of people around this glass globe in which you can see there's a bird. And if you look at the center, the focus of the picture really is a, uh, a girl who looks like, you know, quite horrified by what's going on. And indeed, what's going on is they're removing the oxygen from this globe in which a bird was and watching it die. So there's a collection of people. But what's significant here in the history of science is uh, at this point in the mid-1600s, people are becoming experimentalists, and it is important for witnesses. So similar to the way in Galileo's Starry Messenger, what he wanted people to do was to replicate his observations of the moon and of the moons of Jupiter. Uh, people who are engaged in these inquiries into whether or not there are vacuums and what happens in a vacuum, what are the properties of a vacuum, are things that people were encouraged to replicate, and you get a bunch of witnesses around to say, yeah, this is what happened, right? So the next slide points to a, a book called Leviathan and the Air Pump, and it's Robert Boyle versus Thomas Hobbes. Now, you might say, Thomas Hobbes, I remember him. He's from uh, Leviathan. He's a, he's a political philosopher, and indeed he is. But again, these people who are engaged in these inquiries are what might be called natural philosophers. So if they're thinking about material reality, they're natural philosophers, but they're also political philosophers. They're also theological philosophers. So uh, all of these men were what are called polymaths. Um, they had... Uh, uh, they were inquiring, inquiring into all kinds of things. So now, uh, Leviathan and the Air Pump, Hobbes, Boyle, and the Experimental uh, Life. It was a book, it was a 1985 prize-winning work of history of science written by Stephen Shapin and Simon Schaefer. Uh, the authors recount the debate during the 1660s between natural philosopher alchemist Robert Boyle and the political philosopher Thomas Hobbes. The authors wish to answer the question, 
why does one do experiments in order to arrive at scientific truth? So today, we wouldn't even question why one would do experiments. But at this point, experimental science is just coming into fashion. And so there's a question of why would they do it? Hobbes's position on natural philosophy has been dismissed by some historians because historians perceived Hobbes as, quote, misunderstanding Boyle's work. Chapin and Schaefer attempt to correct that misperception of Hobbes's objection to Boyle's position. So what exactly was Boyle's position? Boyle's, Boyle is a corpuscularian. We have not yet heard of corpuscularianism. Boyle was a cor corpuscularian a term he employed to paper over the differences between believers in a vacuum and believers in a plenum, given that both of them agreed that the explanation of natural occurrences should be solely in terms of particles of matter, their motion, and interaction. Boyle consistently refused to pronounce on the question of whether these minima naturalia should be considered atoms in a strict sense of that term or not. So, Again, we have not yet had people sort of identify elements at an atomic level, and we have people who have been reading the ancient philosophers, and some of them say there are things called atoms, there, uh, and so Boyle would prefer uh, the, the use of the term corpuscle instead of atom. So we then go to, Arist we return to Aristotle's four causes. We've covered this once before. So again, all of these people are recipients of a or Aristotle heavy uh, academic education. And so Aristotle addressed the question of cause and broke it into four groups. It's an especially confusing concept. Aristotle provides some clarity by differentiating among four different kinds of cause. Material, of what is an object made? Wood could be a material cause of a table. Marble, the material cause of a statue. Formal, what makes an object be the way it is? The cube or the sphere could be the formal cause of a material object. Similarly, numbers or a specific ratio could be the formal cause of something like a musical octave. And remember, music was part of the quadrivium. Music is included with arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy. The efficient cause. What is the primary agent by which matter took its form? The cobbler is the efficient cause of a shoe. A sculptor, the efficient cause of a statue. And then... The tricky one, final cause. What is the sake for which something takes place? A mature plant is the final cause of the seed. Cutting is the final cause of a knife. Of the four different causes, this is the most metaphysical and the one that might represent the greatest obstacle, obstacle to a scientific habit of mind. So we just read Bacon, Advancement of Learning, and one of the contributions that Bacon makes, in addition to generally saying, we're going we're gonna to get a, real, a lot of these Aristotelian ideas in our higher education, is he's going to get rid of two of Aristotle's causes. In his Advancement of Learning, 1605, Francis Bacon wrote, the natural science doth make inquiry and take consideration of the same natures. But how? Only as to the material and efficient cause of them, and not as to the forms. Using the terminology of Aristotle, Bacon demands that apart from the laws of nature themselves, the causes relevant to natural science are only efficient causes and material causes, or to use the formulation which became famous later, natural phenomena require scientific explanation in terms of matter and motion. So Aristotle's formal cause, the one that would say a sphere or a cube or an octave is a cause, and his final cause are booted out of scientific consideration. Now, we come to Boyle's philosophy of experiment. Boyle was one of the first philosophers to develop a philosophy of experiment. His view, which derived in part from Francis Bacon, has many parallels with that of his fellow experimental, Robert Hooke, and his Bacon-Boyle-Hooke philosophy of experiment came to exert great influence on the development of natural philosophy in the late 17th century. Boyle's view of experiment is best understood in the context of the newly emerging experimental philosophy of the early Royal Society of London. In the early 1600s, and its precursor groups in Oxford in the late 1650s, at, at this time, the discipline of natural philosophy was shifting from being regarded as a speculative science, like, say, theology, to being an operative or practical science in which experiments played a central role. 
And once again, this is from the Stanford Encyclopedia uh, of Philosophy, which again is the sort of uh, better quality um, Wikipedia in that it is uh, uh, vetted and written by uh, professional philosophers. So then Hobbes is critical of Boyle's experiments. He's skeptical about the allegedly public and witness character of the experiments. He says it's pointless to perform a series of experiments. If one could discern causes from natural effects, then a single experiment should suffice. He denies the status of philosophy to experiments. For Hobbes, philosophy demonstrated how effects followed from causes or inferred causes from effects. And he denied the claim, the claimed procedural boundary between the results of experiments, which are facts, and the physical causes that account for them, theories. So again, these are all sort of epistemological objections from Hobbes, the political theorist, political philosopher, to uh, Boyle's practices. And then uh, Hobbes' uh, criticisms continue. He treated experimentalist hypotheses and conjectures as statements about real causes. Whatever hypothetical cause Boyle claimed, Hobbes proffered an alternative and superior explanation that was already available. Boyle's explanations invoked vacuism. Hobbes' alternative proceeded from plenism. All experiments carry with them theoretical assumptions embedded in the actual construction and functioning of the apparatus. In principle, the practice those assumptions could all in principle and practice those assumptions could always be challenged. The trouble with experiments chapter of Leviathan and air pumps. So there you have it, a sort of synopsis of the history of the objections to and questions about the existence of a vacuum, which uh, then get resolved when uh, Robert Boyle actually creates a vacuum and is able to demonstrate before audiences the kinds of things that do and do not occur in a vacuum.